collaborative event sponsored by the NASA Institute, the Economic Society of the Bahamas, the Banking and Economics Department of the University. This collaboration has started many years ago. I, I don't recall right now when it first started the relationship between the, the university and the NASA Institute. But um, since its inauguration, I would say that it's been a, a pleasant one. Many students have passed through this um, lecture series, and I can assure you many students who have left the Institute would, 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 come, would come back and they would report, boy, I certainly enjoy those presentations. These presentations, I guess, were indelibly um, imprinted on their minds. But let me tell you something about the Institute. Um, if, you, if you see the handout, most times you take handouts and then you don't, um, you don't read it. I'll just read the first paragraph so you get some idea what the Institute is all about. The Institute was founded in 1995. Um, it's a think tank that promotes capitalism and free markets. The mission of the Institute is to move is to promote public policies for the Bahamas based on the principles of limited government, individual freedoms, and the rule of law. The mission of the Institute is, is to promote a political, sorry, it's a apolitical non-profit institute that promotes economic growth and freedom in a free market economy with limited government, in a society that embraces the rule of law and the rights of private property. Now, uh, many of you who've taken my class probably understand these principles well. And these principles of free market and limited government are the salient points of the Institute. In other words, it's the framework in which our thoughts are developed. And you'll see that in the presentation tonight. Our presentation tonight will focus on classical liberalism in two emancipation events from 1865. These events include the abolition of slavery in the United States due to the American Civil War and the um, colonial upheaval of the British West Indies in the aftermath of the Jamaican's Mohawk um, Bay Massacre. In these cases, classical liberal thinkers provide the intellectual ammunition against state sanctioned oppression, whereby advancing the cause of individual freedoms in the United States and in the Caribbean. So this presentation I guess would be very thought provoking. And I want you to remain focused. And I want the, the takeaway to be that even back then, the idea of limited government and free market was the salient point that governed the economy and, I, and directed the, the economy in an environment in which consumer sovereignty prevailed. To get started, I'd like to ask our chairperson, Mr. Daniel Thompson, to come and give some opening remarks. He is also a professor in marketing and statistics. Good morning. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to take this opportunity once again to welcome you to the University of Bahamas and to really say thank you to the NASA Institute and Templeton Religious Trust and the two units within the School of Business and Hospitality Management of which Professor Andy Forbes is a part, that is the Banking, Economics and Finance Department. The, I'd like to recognize in our absence the HOD for that department, Ms. Dale McCarty, who is at another engagement. And also the student focus economic society within the School of Business and Hospitality Management. And I think some of their members also are 
here on the other side at the meeting with Mr. McCarty. Like Mr. Forbes, like Professor Forbes mentioned, the Institute and the University of the Bahamas have, we have been together for some time. And over the years, they have brought some provocative discussions and things that really make you think. One of the things, the messages that I've always left with students is the whole idea to be critical listeners and critical thinkers. And uh, while Mr. Forbes has indicated the foundation upon which the, found the Institute is built, as you listen to Dr. Magnus as he speaks, ask the critical questions, is it really so? Could there be other explanations? Is there another perspective of what he says? And challenge yourselves as you listen. And at the same time, being a critical thinker means that you must learn to be open-minded to some degree. But at the same time, you cannot be gullible. The topic that Dr. Magnus is presenting on slavery, abolition, and classical liberalism is of interest to all of us in this post-colonial society here in the Caribbean. And it's interesting that we see persons from different backgrounds who come into our society and speak on topics that are relevant to us, to our history, to our culture, to our development. May his presentation also challenge you as students and faculty, as researchers, about the opportunity to engage in research from so many different perspectives. And I trust that uh, Dr. Magnus' presentation will help stir a lot of curiosity in your, in your thinking. So listen, I know you hear some of you are here under the gun to get marks and to sign in. I understand that. <laughs> some of you are being force fed. I appreciate that. But I trust that in spite of why you're here and how you got here, that you would leave here enriched, enlightened, and that be a person. Learners, faculty, students, enjoy yourself today. God bless you. Thank you. specializing in the law of 19th century United States, as well as general macroeconomic trends. He is a leading expert in, on black colonization during the Civil War era and studies the political economy of slavery in the Atlantic world, particularly its relationship to public policy. Dr. Magnus' research has appeared in multiple scholarly and popular venues, including the Journal of the Early Republic, the Journal of the Abraham Lincoln Association, and the Journal of the Supreme Court History. His popular press writings have appeared in Newsweek, Britannica.com, and the New York Times. Dr. Magnus holds a BA in Political Science from the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. He later obtained his MDP and PhD from the George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, specializing on policy history. He is currently a visiting associate professor of the economics of economics at Berry College and a senior research fellow of the American Institute for Economic Research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Matthew Silvestre. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, thanks again for joining. Uh, thank you again to the NASA Institute and also uh, to Professor Forbes and the department here for hosting me. Um, as you can see, I've got a, a topic we're going to be discussing that is uh, very politically charged from history. It's something that touches um, all parts of the world. It's a, an area of specialty that I came to studying as an American looking at the American Civil War, but discovered over the, uh, the course of several years that uh, that picture is way too narrow to discuss slavery strictly in the context of the United States 
it's actually a global story and it's a story that crosses over the Atlantic. And what we find out uh, uh, very quickly on, if we start probing into the records, it's a story that involves the Caribbean. So I'm going to try and unite two different uh, strands of economic history together, both the United States and the Caribbean, as we explore this issue. But I'm also gonna do it from a, uh, an economic perspective that dives into uh, theory and some familiar names to you. First one, first name that'll come up, we'll talk about him in a minute, it's a fellow by the name of Adam Smith. You all have heard of Adam Smith, I'm assuming if you're a, uh, an economics major, it's normally taught in the, uh, uh, the very first semester. Uh, he's basically the guy that founds the discipline. And he does so, he writes a book called uh, The Wealth of Nations in 1776, so a while ago. Uh, but even before he wrote The Wealth of Nations, he was a well-known academic at his university. He taught at the University of Edinburgh uh, for a while and wrote several books before that. Uh, one in particular called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, and then he had a series of lectures going all the way back to the 1750s. And there's one unifying theme of all of his works, if you look at Adam Smith's collected works, anyone want to take a guess of what it is? The same topic comes up over and over again, different angles. I'm sorry? Uh, economics is there, but economics is one of three things that he talks about in relation to this topic. You may get, get, get a glimpse from the slide here. Slavery. Adam Smith is one of the first academics to write about a theory of what slavery is and why it's a problem. And he does so as early as the 1750s. He actually makes three arguments over the course of his career against slavery. Uh, so we can actually kind of celebrate him. If you're an economics major, Adam Smith is also one of the great abolitionists of that era. Uh, so three charges he makes against slavery. The first one's the easy one, the one that we all know, morality. Slavery violates your rights, it's immoral. And he does this in a really uh, uh, kind of interesting philosophical way. So he says, imagine yourself in the position of a slave. And that was easier in his own day when slavery is a, a very prominent part of society than it is for us looking back. But imagine yourself in the position of a slave. Would you want to be in that position? No. So he sees something intuitive that we can derive from that, that, it, that slavery is morally wrong, because none of us would want to be in that position. So why do we allow other people to be in that position? Why do we put other people in that position? Therefore, it's wrong. So that's the moral case. That's the easy one. But he also says there are economic problems with slavery, two in particular. One, he says slavery is inefficient economically. It's a bad way to produce things. It's a bad way to grow crops, but it exists. But uh, he says, you know, in a perfect world, if you had one farm that was run on slavery and one farm where they paid their workers, he'd make a prediction, all else equal, which one would do better economically? The one that pays the workers, why? Incentive, you've got an incentive at play. Uh, so if you have an incentive to work harder, you get paid more, right? You have an incentive, now, now imagine you're a farmer, you're getting paid to uh, produce a crop and uh, you think, hey, I've got a new way that I can harvest this crop more efficiently. I can invent something that makes it faster. Are you gonna do that if you get paid more? Absolutely, that, makes you, that means promotion or maybe you own your own farm and you can outcompete all your, uh, your other neighbors. Now imagine you're in a situation of slavery. Do you have an incentive to invent anything at all? No. no. Uh, your only incentive there is you're going to get beaten if you don't do what the uh, slave owner tells you to do, which is a pretty horrible incentive. So he says all else equal, slavery is going to be less efficient than free labor. But he says there's another problem. We see slavery exists in the world and in some places it's profitable. Why is it profitable if, even if it's inefficient? This is politics politics. And that's where he gets into his third theory here. And I refer to it as public choice because it lines up with a modern branch of economics. But he says, slavery tends to become politically entrenched. And when slave owners run the legislature, run the government, run the local customs house, run the local courthouse, what do you think they do? They make sure slavery stays around. So that's his big argument. He says, the problem with slavery is politics. We can't get rid of it because slave owners are also politicians. They also work in the government. He even says in one, one place, he says, our society on this one issue of slavery would, we, would be better if we had a, uh, an autocratic monarch because all it would take is that monarch to say slavery is abolished and it's gone. 
but the society that we do have, or that he did have in the uh, 1750s, uh, you couldn't do that. You had a parliament. You had to go through steps of legislation. Therefore, the problem that emerges. And he actually says, this, I'll leave that up. It's a short quote. He says that the persons who make all the laws in the country are the persons who have slaves themselves. And that's the big problem. They'll never make any laws mitigating the usage of slaves because that cuts into their own interest. Uh, he says, basically, we have an interest group that has captured the government, and that interest group is slavery. That's a problem. So how do we get rid of it? If you're Adam Smith, you think slavery is morally wrong and economically unprofitable, yet it's politically entrenched, what do you do about it? Any ideas? Ah, you can campaign against it. And you know, he's an academic, so he's writing about it uh, in abstract ways. He's lecturing about it. To, uh, to students in the university. But uh, he's not a political actor, he's not a politician. But he does see other people around him in his time, some of his other contemporaries. And I'm gonna give you a short uh, timeline of the pathway to abolition from roughly Adam Smith's time. So 1772, that's Adam Smith still alive, all the way up to 1850s, and then uh, 1865 is kind of our capstone year because that's when the United States finally abolishes slavery. But you notice the United States is behind the curve, the uh, British Empire's first. 1772, famous legal case in Great Britain called Somerset's case. Somerset was a slave, and his owner brought him over to England on a visit there, on a business visit. And he arrived on the shores of England, and some abolitionists looked around and said, uh, wait a minute, slavery's not legal in England. No one ever enacted that law here. It is in the colonies, but not in England. So they filed a suit on behalf of Somerset. And the court reviewed the laws and said, you know, you're right, there's no law that allows you to bring a slave into England, therefore slavery is abolished. And that starts the ball rolling. Uh, it only affects Somerset at first, but it, it very gradually diffuses into England to where it's no longer permissible to have slaves. This kind of ignites a, uh, a political movement to start bringing abolition by small baby steps very early on, uh, up to the forefront of the political discussion. The first bill that comes up that really has any chance is in 1791, and it's proposed by this guy, this very large, rotund uh, fellow by the name of uh, Charles James Fox. He was the head of the Whig Party in the British Parliament, uh, also a very legendary gambler, drinker, and imbiber of good spirits. Uh, but uh, his one cause that he said uh, he, he was in Parliament for like 30 years, and he says, if there's one thing that I should be remembered for, let it be this, that I abolished the slave trade. Uh, so he really cared about this one issue. And why the slave trade first? Well, he thought incremental steps were necessary to get this underway. Uh, he knew some of the political opposition. He, pr he proposes the bill in 1791. It takes to 1807 until he gets it passed. So that, that's a while. And he actually dies right on the eve of the final vote. He gets the first vote secured, and then he passes away, and uh, some of his understudies, his protégés in Parliament pushed it through. But then there's another uh, gap of uh, 23, 24 years before slavery emerges back again as another issue. So the slave trade's abolished. You can't carry slaves across the Atlantic in ships, but by the 1830s, slavery is still around. And then there's a series of revolts that break out in the colonies. So this is the really interesting thing. This is what forces the hand of the slave-owning politicians. Slavery is a very costly system to maintain. Why? Why would it be costly? Because people try to escape. Yeah. You'd want to escape. And how do you stop escaping? You kill them. Or you hire guards or you hire a militia. You invest in a military to put down revolts, put down uh, suppression. And this is true every place in human history that slavery has existed. They have to invest in a military, invest in people to enforce laws to keep the slaves on the plantation, keep them working. That's a problem, because that's very costly. So if you're a slave owner and you control the government, what do you do? You vote people's tax money to hiring these militias or arming uh, the military or hiring slave patrols to put down revolts. Well, what's one way to challenge that, to make it much more costly to put down a slave revolt? It's to actually revolt. So, in the 1830s, 
there are a succession of revolts that break up. The biggest one is uh, referred to as the Baptist War in Jamaica, uh, although uh, pretty much all islands in the British Caribbean have a revolt of some point in their history. Uh, but this triggers a discussion and Parliament finally says, and it's actually some of the heirs of Fox uh, and another fellow by the name of William Wil Wilberforce who had been involved in the early bill. Uh, they advance a, a new law in Parliament that says we're going to abolish slavery across the empire. It passes in 1833, takes effect August 1st, 1834, Emancipation Day. And that's the end of the institution. It's not the end of the problems that slavery caused though. And actually what we see is for the next several decades, there's a weird economic stagnation that plays out in the Caribbean. And this is kind of vexing to the economists because remember Adam Smith says slavery is inefficient. Slavery goes away, we should see efficiency, we should see better economic output, and yet there's economic stagnation. It's like a depression kicks in in the 1840s and it lasts a couple decades. So people are scratching their heads, what's going on here? We got rid of slavery, why aren't we doing better? Is the big question that they're asking. Well, that's something that I want to jump into. I'll try and give you an explanation. Well, there's a, a quick picture of the revolt itself in Jamaica, or a sketch of it in 1831. And it's basically the, the slaves armed themselves and they raided and destroyed the plantation. That triggers it all, sends it into motion. So why did emancipation take so long though? Adam Smith, remember, had the answer. Slave owners controlled the government. So we have to act incrementally. Also this guy is one of the reasons that emancipation takes so long. It's a fellow by the name of Bannister Tarleton. Uh, he was a famous British military officer and hence that's, that's why he's depicted and all this flamboyant clothing. But uh, he was also a member of parliament that represented a constituency in Liverpool, which is one of the main port cities. And Liverpool had economic interests invested in the slave trade. That's where all the ships left from. And he voted his constituency, so he blocked the bill for almost 20 years. Uh, so there's another a classic, like tangible example of a slave owner, uh, slave trader, someone who's connected economically to that operating in Parliament and preventing anything from happening. But they finally get through incremental advances after 1807, an abolition of the slave trade. And what this does is it declares that the British Navy is going to use its warships to intercept slave trade, intercept ships that are coming across the Atlantic with slaves on board. And they do this for the next 40, 50 years, uh, basically until the Americans abandon slavery in 1865. They are fighting a war against the slave trade. So, you're a British uh, Navy sea captain, you intercept a ship that's coming across the Atlantic and it's already made it to the Caribbean. It's trying to dock in Florida or Georgia or South Carolina, one of these ports that uh, uh, is receiving slaves. But you intercept it, you're a warship captain. What do you do with the 300 people that are on board? Well, you free them. That's, that's the official policy. But where do you take them? You suddenly have 300 passengers now on the ship that you've intercepted that were about to be sold into slavery. They've been dragged from their homes across the Atlantic and now they're here in the Caribbean. You put them on an island. <laughs> that's, uh, and that's what uh, the British government did. They adopted a policy, it was called the recaptives policy. They're recaptured from slavery uh, and they actually populate much of the Caribbean with uh, people that are intercepted from these slave ships. Uh, the stats are not all that great, but I looked them up the other night. Uh, the Bahamas had over 7,000 recaptives that were placed throughout. Jamaica got most of them, Barbados, uh, all of the British possessions, whatever the nearest island was, they tried to, uh, uh, to basically colonize and, and house the recaptive uh, freed prisoners of the slave trade there. So this continues for 40 or 50 years. It's a major event in world history. And again, we have finally the slave revolts force a change of hands. Now I want to bridge the Atlantic. I want to come over to the United States and talk a little bit about what's going on there. Well, first off, abolitionists in the United States, including black abolitionists, uh, Frederick Douglass is the, probably the most famous of that, but there are several other people around him, are paying attention to what England is doing and how England is getting rid of slavery. They're paying attention to what's going on in the West Indies as well because there are anti-slavery societies in the West Indies. Up until 1834, they're trying to get rid of this institution. And they're asking themselves, okay, they successfully did it in 1834. How do we copy that? How do we bring that to America? 
one of the things they do, well, we got to go over to England and visit with these people and ask them. So there's a, uh, a major convention that's held in London in 1840. And it's named after the building it was held in, a uh, big meeting hall called Exeter Hall. It's in downtown London, prime real estate today. I think there's a hotel located there now. But uh, the meeting brought in hundreds of people, not only from England, all the old English abolitionists, but across the world. They had, uh, I've counted eight identified delegates from the West Indies that came there, 28 from the United States. Uh, we, we know of at least three black uh, delegates from the United States as well that are there. Frederick Douglass unfortunately was not, but some other people that ran in his circles were. Uh, the most no notable was a fellow by the name of Charles Lennox Raymond, who is probably the second or third most famous black abolitionist in the U.S. Uh, but he comes over there. Douglass visited later and asked these guys about strategy. How do we fight slavery? And the key player here is the guy standing up with his finger doing that. That is an individual, you can guess the name right there, Thomas Clarkson who's the president of the convention. He was about 80 years old at this time. He was one of the originals that started back in 1791 when that first bill came up to abolish the slave trade. Uh, so he's the older statesman of the anti-slavery movement, so they choose him as president. Uh, there are a couple other not notable people, and they, they tried to draw this painting so it's not like true to the session, but they tried to represent everyone that's there. So uh, you can see the picture, there's, there's Clarkson, uh, an old portrait of him standing up. Uh, there's Charles Lennox Raymond, and you can see he's right there. Another individual here that's kind of interesting for uh, some Caribbean ties, but a guy by the name of John Scoble, he was a Canadian. He resided in, in Canada, he's right there. Um, I love this portrait for one little twist on it. Uh, Scoble, despite being anti-slavery, had uh, some racist sentiments of, of his own. He was a very prejudiced person. He did dislike slavery, but he was personally prejudiced. And when the meeting convened, the, uh, the story was that he didn't want to be sat next to the black delegates. So what do you think the painter did? Right there, right there, right there. Put him right in the middle of them. So that, that, that painter had a, uh, a good twist of irony uh, involved. Uh, but he's another character that comes up in part of our story. Uh, the British abolitionists convey their message to the Americans. Two other figures that are involved, although he wasn't at that convention I showed, he's also active in the movement. This is a fellow by the name of Richard Cobden, who's kind of the great intellectual leader of classical liberalism in the mid-19th century. He's best known for fighting for free trade, but he also fought for abolitionism. And he had a friend that lived on the other side of the Atlantic, Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts in the United States who's basically the main abolitionist that had been proposing bills. And we actually have records, we have a speech from Charles Sumner where uh, anti-slavery figures, uh, he's at, at this big rally, I think it's the 4th of July, uh, Independence Day, Frederick Douglass and all these other characters are there asking him, what do we do, how do we fight slavery? And he says, well, let me ask my friend Richard Cobden, let's ask the British what they did. And we can use their model that they fought not only for anti-slavery, but for free trade. And we can adapt that to our strategies and fight slavery in the United States. Cobden invents a political philosophy that historians have dubbed in the aftermath as Cobdenism. His name is basically three planks, anti-slavery, free trade, and anti-colonialism. He says these three are natural allies of a movement. We need to merge them together and we can fight with that. There are some other components as well. This guy's familiar. Who is that? Abraham Lincoln. So uh, he's the president of the United States in the Civil War, wins the Civil War, signs the Emancipation Proclamation. Less familiar, and I bring him in uh, because he has a connection to both Lincoln and the Caribbean. This is a, uh, an abolitionist, African-American abolitionist from the United States by the name of John Willis Maynard. And he's born as a free black in a northern state from a family that came out of the Caribbean. We don't know exactly where, but they migrated some point probably in the late 18th century. Uh, but free black from the north, he's an anti-slavery speaker. And his distinction is, he's the first African American to be hired by the federal government of the United States in an administrative position. So think about that kind of historically. What do you think he was hired to do? Well, he was hired by Abraham Lincoln, so he went to work in Lincoln's administration in 1863. And he was appointed in the office 
that uh, we don't know much about today because it's never talked about, but something that Lincoln believed in, uh, the office that oversaw a policy called black immigration and colonization. And the idea was behind this policy is uh, Lincoln thought that after the Civil War, uh, the situation for former slaves in the South is not going to be very good. Uh, we should give them options to move to other places in the world where they think uh, there's going to be a better political climate. They're going to have better rights and more protections. And one of those places that they're looking at is the Caribbean. So Maynard, in the employ of Lincoln, actually travels throughout the Caribbean in 1863 and 1864, scoping out sites, uh, mostly working with the British Empire. So we'll get, a, get into a little bit of that. But I, I bring this all together so we see these two stories are merging. You have Britain and the United States, but they're merging over the course of the Civil War. And actually, uh, there's a picture of one of the leaflets that this office put out. That's the ship that they were advertising to freed slaves. They say, come on board, here's this nice ship. And they, they have like the map of the cabins and everything. Uh, we could sell it out of Baltimore and it'll be in the Caribbean in eight days, which is really fast for that period of time. Uh, he was really looking at Jamaica. He ends up settling on uh, British Honduras or modern day Belize as the, the favored location. But uh, this all kind of comes together. Remember I mentioned that the uh, West Indies went into a depression, an economic recession, depression, immediately after slavery is abolished. Well, this starts another debate in the British Parliament. What's going on in the colonies? And the colonies themselves are getting involved. They have a local voice. Well, there are two views. One's the classical liberal view. And it basically says economic woes exist, but they're overstated. And really the problems we're seeing are deriving from government and specifically colonial government. And they go through all the evidence and they say, one, the colonies are overtaxed. Taxes are too high, that's causing economic stagnation. We have trade protection, barriers to trade so they can't sell their goods, they can't import goods uh, at a fair and reasonable price because again, we're taxing it. We're trying to distort that trade. There's a lack of clear property rights laws, especially if you're a freed slave, it's really hard to get property. Uh, not only because you, you don't have anything to buy it with, but the laws would not recognize uh, claims to land that had been abandoned. Uh, after slavery goes away, they have a problem with plantation owners living back in Europe that just abandoned their plantations. Land's not being used. And if you live in Jamaica, what do you do? Well, occupy it. No one's using this land. I'm going to go build a house there. And then the plantation owner shows up five years later, hey, you're on my land, what does he do? Calls the militia, evict that guy. And they do that, it's a really ugly uh, type of a policy. So the liberals are saying, stop this nonsense. This is abandoned land. Uh, so absenteeism exists, and then there's also political corruption. There are like local officials that are being paid off by these rich guys that are coming back from England and trying to claim land that they had abandoned. So that's the liberal decolonization view. Here's the Tory or reactionary view, which is the other faction in British Parliament. They said, the economic woes of the Caribbean are caused by the end of slavery. Adam Smith was wrong. Uh, they appeal to racist explanations. Uh, so they're saying, oh, well, that, that the problem is that the freed slaves, they're just uh, lazy. They need someone to come in and force them to work again. So a really horrible type of a mindset. Uh, they said, work exists for the slaves, but they just won't take it. Uh, we need to import laborers. Uh, we need to appeal to what they called the gospel of work theory. This theory that if we force people to work, it'll make them better and make them proper for entry into what they considered a uh, civilized society. So it's a really racist retrograde view versus a liberal decolonization view that comes together. And these things are in tension. So even though Britain's putting it for itself forth as like the, uh, the beacon of freedom in the world, well, the abolitionists are aware of what's going on in the United States as well, so that our stories are continuing to come together. And uh, these are just title pages of a couple pamphlets that I want to show you. First one, look at that name right there. Thomas Clarkson, you saw him before. He's the, he's the guy doing that in the, in the photograph, or the painting. Uh, the original anti-slavery guy, this is one of the last things he writes, I think it's 1844, it's published. It is a... Uh, uh, an address to Jamaica, but he's talking about the entire West Indies. This is a solution to the economic problems of the West Indies. And he's espousing this decolonization liberal approach. So he's still fighting that battle. Then you have another guy, this is 1849. This is a, uh, a member of the Jamaican General Assembly. Comes to the United States and Canada and says, hey, you know, 
Slavery still exists in the United States. Quite a few slaves are escaping their masters. They're running to the north. They're taking the Underground Railroad up to Canada. And he says, I've got a better place for you. It's not as cold. Come to Jamaica. Come to Jamaica and we will host you there. Uh, so he's a member of the legislature. He's a, he's a Scotsman, but he's the law partner of another member of the legislature that comes into our story in just a minute uh, by the name of George, uh, George Gordon. And he is a major player in some events that are going to come up. But first I want to talk to you a little bit about the racist reaction. So all this crusading to end slavery, end colonization, uh, and basically transition to a modern free economy in the Caribbean, as well as end slavery in the United States, provokes a backlash, as these things always do. Uh, the character, the chief culprit of this ba backlash, the intellectual adversary of the Smithians, is a uh, famous Scottish writer by the name of Thomas Carlyle. And there's a picture, actually, uh, there's a picture of Thomas Carlyle. Uh, he actually posed intentionally uh, in the same style of that painting, which I always thought was kind of weird. Got the same artist to paint it. But he's a, uh, a Scottish uh, man of letters, historian, writer, major academic, and leading intellectual figure of kind of that reactionary movement. And Carlyle basically declares, and all of you that are majors in economics should uh, be proud of this. Carlisle basically declares, says, economics is at war with slavery. Economics is at war with slavery. And what does he mean by that? Economics is not a gay science, not a happy science, but a rueful one that finds the secrets of the universe and the laws of supply and demand and reduces the duty of human governors to letting men alone. How dare they? Uh, he says, basically the science of economics has joined forces with the philanthropy of Exeter Hall, or that meeting hall that held the giant anti-slavery meeting, and created a dismal science. Who's ever heard of the economics referred to as the dismal science? Uh, this is where it originates in. This is the first guy that coins that term. And it's led by the sacred cause of black emancipation or the like, and they made a wedding of it that will give birth to uh, uh, progenies and prodigies. Uh, and he goes into all this uh, monstrous hyperbole of trying to des uh, describe the horrors that are going to come about because the economists have joined forces with the abolitionists. They've become adherents of Cobdenism. So he says that's our enemy. Well, Adam Smith is long gone by then, he's dead. But Adam Smith's intellectual descendants, one of which is this fellow, John Stuart Mill, responds to Carlyle. And he says, look you idiot, is basically his, uh, his approach to him says, at this point of crisis in world history, this crisis of American slavery, uh, when there's a decisive conflict being fought between right and wrong, right and inequity, what have you done? You've just stepped in and flung this missile loaded with the weights of your reputation into the abolitionist camp. The words of English writers of celebrity are words of power on the other side of the ocean, and the owners of human flesh will welcome such an auxiliary as yourself. So he's chastising them. This is the liberal fighting against the reactionary, the free market guy fighting against the anti-market guy. And Mill is right. His prediction plays out. Within a year, a pamphlet appears in the United States written by this guy, George Fitzhugh. He's the leading pro-slavery theorist of the Southern Confederacy. He writes a, uh, a book called The Sociology for the South and a follow-up a few years later uh, called Cannibals All or Slaves Without Masters, arguing that slavery is the proper way to order society. This is what radicalizes slavery on the eve of the American Civil War. And wh who do you think that Fitzhugh cites as his main inspiration for writing these books? He even takes the title from a passage. Carlyle. Carlyle, he says, thank you, Thomas Carlyle. You've given me the ammunition I needed, just like Mill said. But uh, Fitzhugh's also an anti-economist. And I'll give you proof of that. This is the opening paragraph of the very first chapter of his book. He focuses not on slavery, but the political economy of free trade. He says free trade is partnered with slavery. Uh, political economy is a science of a free society. Its theory and its history alike establish this. Uh, fundamental maxim of laissez-faire are at war with all kinds of slavery. So he's saying the same thing as Carlyle. This is the intellectual ammunition the Southern Confederacy is building its case on and they are fighting against the free market abolitionists. 
that are critics of the institution. I won't get into the details of the Civil War save to note who won. The North did. And it played out as a gradual move in Abraham Lincoln's philosophy from simply holding the Union together to he finally declares we're going to emancipate the slaves of the United States. Emancipation Proclamation is signed on January 1st, 1863. But remember I mentioned the, uh, the problem of what do we do with a post-slavery society? He sees racial oppression is still an issue. Uh, and he actually goes to kind of this retrograde view. It says, well, maybe we should subsidize uh, the freed blacks of the United States to move to the Caribbean. So he reignites that idea. Uh, this is a copy of a, um, a little known document that he issued a few months after the Emancipation Proclamation. I found that in the archives of Belize. There's also another copy in the archives of Jamaica. I believe that a copy was sent to every island in the Caribbean that was in, in the British Empire at the time, so there might be one here in the Bahamas. Uh, paper signed by Abraham Lincoln. Not what you expect in a Caribbean archive, but it's a partnership. He says, we're going to join with the British Empire and we're going to subsidize any freed slave that wants to migrate to the Caribbean to do so, which is kind of interesting. And they think they're going to have some takers at first, but there are some problems with the way that it launches. Um, actually, they had a colony set up in British Honduras or Belize. I found this in the jungle. It's an archaeological site, but this is the, the sugar processing plant that they built specifically for intending uh, American freed slaves to come down to Belize in 1863. Uh, it never quite launched. It was never really used, uh, just abandoned in the jungle, and it sits there today. But the reasons have to do with another event. Remember, there were still problems in the Caribbean, still problems economically and politically, and those problems are being crusaded against by the liberals on free market grounds. We'll fast forward a little bit to Jamaica. January 1865, very tail end of the American Civil War, but Jamaica, remember, is being put forth as this wonderful place. Come to Jamaica, not Canada, if you want to escape slavery. Come to the rest of the Caribbean as well. But it's the centerpiece of the British colonial administration as well. It's where their uh, main government operation had been. And an abolitionist visited Jamaica to tour the country, to t uh, see what was going on, and he writes back a letter to the colonial office in London and says, these are the problems. Same things that had been pointed out 20 and 30 years before. Taxation is too high. Uh, much of the island is just left abandoned. Uh, people that try to export goods meet with discouragement. There's monetary manipulation at play, unjust taxation. Uh, capitalist avoidance of Jamaica because they know there's going to be political problems. Uh, and he says, you know, if we want to fix this, these, these are all the prescriptions that we need. We need rule of law, clear property rights, free trade, tax relief, do something about uh, uh, the problem of freed black residents of Jamaica being able to access basic instruments of the economy and unemployment will dissipate. That'll be the solution there. So he proposes this and it starts a political movement. Remember I, uh, I said the name George William Gordon he is a black member of the Jamaican Assembly at the time, probably the most prominent of the liberal figures. We only have a, a picture of him in a sketch, uh, but he is the champion of this letter that's made, this diagnosis that's made in January 1865, and he, and he starts putting forth legislation in the Assembly to address all these problems. Interesting thing about Mr. Gordon is he also knows our old friend John Willis Maynard, the employee of the Lincoln administration who had been sent to investigate the Caribbean. In fact, he convinced Maynard to relocate to Jamaica himself and set up a school. Maynard was college educated in the North in the United States. And I said, we need people that are, uh, are literate, people that are, uh, are well respected and read to come teach basically the peasants, peasant class of Jamaica, uh, how to do things how to engage in agricultural trades, how to write, how to uh, uh, economize, take advantage of these new laws that Mr. Gordon has put forth. And Gordon's a landowner, uh, so he has some independent wealth. He gives, uh, as best as I can tell, Maynard attractive land. And the parish of St. Thomas in the east, very eastern end of Jamaica, Maynard arrives, sets up a newspaper, sets up schools. Things are going well for a couple weeks. Then something happens backlash. 
October 7th, 1865. This is where I'm going to end the, the story. It's a, a tragic one. But October 7th, 1865 in Morant Bay, uh, the main uh, town administrative center of St. Thomas in the East, the parish where Maynard had set up, there was a court case brought against a very poor black man who had set up on one of these abandoned plantations, had built a house. The owner came back, they dragged him off of his house, brought him into court and tried to throw him into prison. And what do you think happened? The locals caught wind and they stepped into the courtroom and they stopped the police from seizing the guy. Then all hell breaks loose. The governor calls out the militia, says suppress these rioters. And the militia indiscriminately goes across the entire parish, murders in cold blood over 400 people just shoots them down. Remember Jamaica, according to Gordon, had been put forth as this is the liberal hope. This is where black people can go in this world and have political rights. The governor of the island says, nope, I'm going to shoot you if you try to assert those political rights. This is a horrendous event and it actually ends in really bad ways. There's, there's governor heir of the island. Uh, it's kind of a ridiculous looking figure, but uh, uh, he declares martial law that same night he breaks and says, okay, militia, go take care of it. I'm going to my fancy dinner party. Comes back, troops are deployed. 400 people are, are indiscriminately slaughtered. Uh, homes are burned down uh, from so-called squatter properties. Uh, they torch the churches because they think that's the organizing area of where uh, the rebels or the, or the, the protesters have emerged. They round up John Willis Maynard, the American who's come there to teach. And they take him to prison and they're about to execute him and finally the U.S. Uh, consul steps in and says, no, wait a minute, he's an American citizen, you can't do that. So he got deported to New Orleans. George William Gordon, unfortunately, had a, uh, a very bad fate. Even though he was on the other side of the island, he was in, in his home in Kingston uh, when this takes place. Ayer saw it as an opportunity to get rid of his political enemy. So he arrests Gordon has him hauled across the island into the parish where there's martial law, declares him guilty under martial law and executes him. Member of the legislature, so a sitting government official is executed for inciting a riot that he had no part in just because it's a political opposition. Problem is parliament investigates and they find that all of this stuff is true. All these horrible events happened. And this is from their long report. I'll leave it up there, I won't read it to you. But what he does say, uh, as you know, that. We've gone through, death was everywhere, it was merciless, it was unnecessary, it was frequent, it was barbarous. Over a thousand houses were cleared off the plantations. But Governor Ayer and the Army followed procedures, therefore we aren't going to do anything. It's a problem. And this is kind of the last hurrah of liberalism though, because the old abolitionists see this and they are outraged. And back in Jamaica, uh, letters start emerging in England people saying, describing the horrors that went down uh, on the ground there. John Willis Maynard actually writes one from New Orleans as soon as he arrives and he sends it to John Stuart Mill, our old friend that attacked Carlisle. And Mill says, we're going to form a committee of the members of parliament and other prominent citizens of the, of the uh, United Kingdom. There's a few names on there. Charles Darwin's one of the more uh, uh, famous one. Uh, Mill is on there. John Bright, who was Cobden's legislative partner, Cobden had died by then, but they form a committee and they say, we're going to try and seek a prosecution of Governor Ayer. We'll bring him up in, in England for murder charges. Did they succeed? Unfortunately, Carlisle appeared again and he says, I'm going to round up all my cronies. And there are all these guys you read about in the English class, Charles Dickens, uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, uh, John Ruskin, these are famous authors, uh, literary men of figures. They joined behind Carlisle and said, we're going to form a legal defense fund for Governor Ayer. Mill succeeds twice at getting uh, Ayer indicted for murder. And then Carlisle succeeds twice at getting the charges thrown out. So that's a really unfortunate event. What does this do? Well, there's Thomas Huxley, that's another character. I love this quote because I'm originally from Texas and he says, you know, if England will not uphold its laws and its colony and will declare this guy a hero, I'm going to have to go somewhere else in the world. Some other place like Texas where there is less hero worship and more respect for, ju for justice. So I'm like, yay, Texas. But uh, uh, the postscript, though, is that this collision that takes place sets the framework for almost all of post-colonialism that's happened ever since. Be good. Slavery's ended in the Caribbean and the United States because of classical liberal ideas. 
free market economics are historically aligned with that cause and anti-colonialism prompts some reform. They start restri retracting the powers of British governors in the Caribbean because of the backlash to this horrible incident. Uh, the bad, heirs not prosecuted, other forms of racism and discrimination persist, colonialism remains a legacy that the world grapples with, and free market economics unfortunately has kind of moved beyond and hasn't really looked at this historical legacy. So this is a challenge that I'll give you all, is to take up that legacy. Remember, you're economists, you're enemies of slavery, you're at war with slavery, in the words of Thomas Carlyle, and the words of George Fitzhugh. So as good economists, we should continue to fight slavery and its legacies and uh, everything that persists to the current day. Um, I'll end on that note. Hopefully it's a little bit of an encouragement on a, an otherwise somber story and be happy to take any questions. Or talk about any of the figures that come up. Yes. Okay. Here at the University from Northern Virginia. Hmm. Northern Virginia. Yep. Okay. I'd like to hear you elaborate a little bit on how slavery continues today yeah. in a different yeah. form. Yeah. And your analysis of that. Yeah. It's a, it's a very complex and long uh, question. It's going to depend on, uh, on different parts of the world. One of which, uh, actually, I'll start on the first uh, component of that. The fact that freed slaves are basically left penniless without property is a huge economic impediment to development. Uh, it's a, a huge economic impediment to getting back on your feet. And this is true in both the Caribbean, as we saw in some of the, the uh, examples here. It's true in the United States as well. And if you're penniless and without property, you probably don't have much political power either. You probably don't have much in the way of clout to throw away around. And what happens in the immediate aftermath in both situations, they put in laws in place to prevent uh, freed slaves from exercising their political rights. So the United States, it took 100 years after the Civil War till we got rid of those laws, basically. Uh, in the Caribbean, similar fashions play out, and it depends island to island uh, and then country to country of what, what happens there before a reform is attempted. But this is why we see a succession of labor revolts, a succession of backlashes and uprisings that keep playing out every 20 or 30 years from the end of slavery up until the mid 20th century, really. So that's a direct legacy, but I'd argue that it's a legacy of a lack of economic empowerment uh, left in the, in the relic of this barbarous system. You know, you give people property, you give them a chance to participate in an economy, then the, then the, the future's kind of in their own hands. It's what you make with it. Uh, give people access to capital, they can build things with it. Give people uh, a chance to participate in trade and sell their goods. Next thing you know, you can start to afford things that were previously out of uh, uh, range for me. So uh, we see an economic chipping away at the institutions that have kind of come in the wake of, uh, of segregation, uh, discrimination, laws that, that followed slavery in both parts of the world. Uh, and that's still kind of ongoing. We still see, haven't completely uh, uh, finished that fight uh, in both countries. So urge you to uh, you know, pay attention to that. Uh, uh, one of the great uh, uh, philosophical quotes I like to, uh, to use, there's an economist by the name of William H. Hutt, uh, who lived in the early 20th, mid 20th century, uh, educated at the London School of Economics. And he used to go around saying, remember, the market is colorblind. It doesn't care what color you are. It, it cares about uh, you know, using a price level as an indicator. And we can use that color blindness to defeat people who do see color in everything and try to enforce it uh, through matters of law and state oppression. So uh, I like to keep going back to that kind of a philosophy uh, as use the market against racism. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting. I've uh, actually written a bit on this subject. Uh, it says it's a big historiographical debate in the academy right now. What's the relationship between capitalism and slavery? And the modern version of it says, well, capitalism and slavery, they're partners. They shake hands. One helps the other. Uh, I dispute that. And I'll go back and I'll cite Adam Smith. 
Adam Smith disputed that too. I'll cite Thomas Carlyle. Thomas Carlyle disputed that too. If you go through anyone that was alive in the period of, uh, of slavery that's writing on the subjects of economics and slavery, they see markets in slavery as adversaries. They see markets as doing something that's going to undermine slavery. Uh, so there's a philosophical conceptual tension there that's at play. Uh, the other version, uh, the other end of that story is the, um, the people that say capitalism and slavery exist hand in hand are basically recycling or re revamping an old argument that was used in the 1850s. And it was used by the Southerners that uh, fought on the side of the Confederacy in the Civil War. They said, cotton is so important to the world economy that we're going to win this war no matter what. No one will declare war on us. They can't afford to lose the cotton crops. And in fact, Europe's going to come to our aid because if they're cut off from cotton, their entire industry falls apart. Do you think it happened that way? No, the exact opposite happened. Uh, British uh, dependence on cotton imports coming out of the United States, when that's cut off during the Civil War as a result of a blockade, they said, fine, we'll get our cotton somewhere else. And they go to free labor. They go to Egypt. They go to the Caribbean. They go to India. And it's not always the best condition of labor, but that they go to uh, other parts of the world that are offering better and more efficient cotton crops. And the South's kind of like, wait a minute, uh, we thought you were going to come to our side, and they never did. So uh, even as a historical event, uh, the thesis that, that capitalism and slavery are operating hands in hands, uh, I think, has trouble grappling with that reality of uh, why it didn't play out that way. Mm -hmm. which is a, com a good example that it could work once they are in power. Yeah. I mean, and I don't, I don't know if you have any comments or in terms of how they actually develop such a robust and dynamic economic environment um, in, in what ought not to have been yeah. in yeah. certain times. Yeah, my, my whole take on, uh, in pretty much any situation, where markets are imperiled by government action, imperiled by the state, uh, you, you find alternative mechanisms in the market that emerge, self-enforcing mechanisms. And they're often hard, hard to spot because, you know, it's legally suppressed. Uh, we don't talk about these things. But I'd say there's one, one key element here, uh, and I stress this in, in uh, classes to economic students, one key element here is that a stable, robust market system where we have clear property rights, where we have uh, clear, peaceful exchanges between people. What does that allow you to do? It allows predictability. It means that I can walk up to a person that I've never met before in my life, and I, if I have something to sell that person, and they're wanting to buy it, we can exchange peaceably and go our way. And we're both better off for it. Uh, we think of this as simple. We all do it every single day. When you go to the lunch counter and you buy something, you hand money, you get something in return. You're both better off. You don't know the person behind the counter, uh, most likely, unless you keep going to a, a friend's restaurant, which is okay. Uh, maybe they'll give you a deal or a coupon. But uh, yeah, they, uh, uh, the idea that exchange operates on peaceful predictability incentivizes the creation of both formal and informal institutions to ensure that that can happen. And when there's a breakdown in trust, when there's a breakdown in those institutions, or they're legally prohibited from happening by law, that's when you have economic collapse. That's when you have economic uh, suppression. And what we see is every society in the world, as it's moved toward a robust property rights system, as it's moved toward a, uh, a respect for free exchange, that tends to inculcate um, economic uplift, economic development. And those societies that don't, those that, that destroy their property rights system, that destroy their monetary base, uh, they look like places like Zimbabwe does today, is one of the classic examples where you have uh, a currency that's in turmoil, properties, uh, rights are non-existent, and you have a corrupt dictator that up until just a few months ago had uh, ruled tyranny over the country. Uh, Venezuela is kind of going in that route in very similar ways. They're destroying economic exchange institutions. So that pushes the economy underground. And my whole argument is, let's let that economy rise to the surface. Let's uh, uh, let it free itself and uh, the participants in it will generally be better off uh, and have the ability to make something better of themselves out of it. All right, thank you.
Good evening, everybody. I certainly hope everybody enjoyed the presentation. Uh, it was very thought-provoking. I will tell you that most persons would not make the connection between slavery and economy except from the profiting by the slave owners. And I, I, I sincerely hope that what you saw and heard today challenges that theory, but more importantly, opens your mind towards the, the, the process of how we need to know some things about how things happened in the past to start to work towards the future. And you guys are the future now sitting here. Challenge it. Challenge the things in the right way, but challenge it and learn and grow from that. Uh, we do have a gift of thanks, Dr. Magnus. <laughs> it's uh, actually a book called The Bahamas, a portrait of the archipelago. We sincerely hope that you enjoy it. Thank you. That's my yeah. Something to remember Appreciate coming into the and making this presentation great. on our behalf, yes. Um, I <coughs> there are also a couple of other folks that we do need to thank, obviously, the university uh, for, having, for hosting this for us. Um, as explained earlier, our relationship from the institute with the university is one that people, we're looking forward to continuing with. These type of series, I think, will only be profitable in a mental and positive growth for the future. So we're looking forward to continuing to do this in the future and hopefully having you back here yeah. because there's a wealth of knowledge traps <laughs> inside here. Um, I think it's philmagnus.com. Yeah. Yeah. I would suggest if any of you folks please take it down, visit his website. There is a wealth of information on there. Um, again, it's really easy to remember, philmagnus.com. Um, there is an, I saw on the site, there's one called Cracks in the Ivory Tower. That's yes. a book you've written. Yes. Or co-written. Co yeah, it's coming out in April. Yep. yep. And then the rules of the game, new gov uh, how governments work and why it sometimes doesn't. I think we can all take yeah. some chapters <laughs> out of that one. Uh, to some of our sponsors, uh, Compass Point, Bahamas Wholesale, Arizona Drinks, um, of course, Templeton. Uh, we do, on behalf of the directors, want to say thank you. Um, but more importantly, thank you. Uh, this is not just us doing something for the sake of doing it. We really want to bring messages to persons. And I am very, very pleased with the number of persons that I see in the audience. It encourages me. And again, on behalf of the Institute, thank you very much for taking the time out even if it was by gunpoint, as expressed earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very glad to see you. But again, thank you all, and good evening.